I give financially to our church because I believe that follows a biblical mandate. It also allows me to combat some of my selfish tendencies. Similarly, our church gives beyond our own needs and beyond our own direct ministries because doing so reminds us we're part of the worldwide church and it also allows us to combat any selfish desires to spend all our resources on ourselves. Join me now in thanksgiving for the following ministry partner whose work our financial giving supports. Did you know that 16% of Spartanburg County adult residents are uninsured? That is over 27,000 people. St. Luke's Free Medical Clinic offers quality health care to uninsured Spartanburg County residents. The clinic meets their need for primary medical care, physician-ordered medications, mental health counseling, and patient education. Services such as x-rays and laboratory tests, inpatient and outpatient procedures are provided by Spartanburg Regional Health Care System. Referrals for specialized care are made through a network of participating physicians. Crucial medications are dispensed at St. Luke's Pharmacy. Some are donated by local physicians and pharmaceutical companies, but many must be purchased for our patients. It is the vision of St. Luke's Free Medical Clinic to be the model for the delivery of quality and compassionate health care for Spartanburg's underserved community. We believe that all individuals deserve access to quality medical care, regardless of ability to pay. We are committed to providing compassionate care to individuals with unmet health care needs in an environment that maintains the dignity of each patient. St. Luke's Free Medical Clinic is a 501c3 tax-exempt organization. The clinic relies on donations, grants, and the community at large to meet an annual operating budget of $1 million. On this budget, over $19 million in medical care and prescription drugs are provided. To learn more about St. Luke's Free Medical Clinic, visit their website at slfmc.org. Sarah Hanks and I am the Associate Minister of Family Life and the Minister of Connections. So it is my honor to welcome you to worship this morning. If you look at the end of your pews, you'll find a black notebook. If you could please let us know that you are here. And if you are visiting with us, if you could give us a phone number or an email address so that we can contact you and thank you for joining us today. As you can see, we have so many exciting things coming up. Um, we especially are excited to start back our Wednesday nights. This Wednesday, we'll start with a drop-in dinner at 5.30, and then IFBC Kids will meet at 7. Jeremiah will be teaching his Bible. No, 6.15. It's over at 7. He's like, ah. <laughs> He's like, I don't want to do that. Uh, so we'll start at 6.15, going to 7 with Bible study, and the youth will also have a leadership class, so we hope that you will join us on that evening. Today, I would like us to think about how, how do you love Jesus? In the text we're going to read today, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And so as you're preparing your hearts and minds, what would be your answer? Would you say, of course I love you? Or would you say, I love you so much and I'm so thankful for you? So let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we gather in your presence today with open hearts and minds. We're ready to worship you. We're ready to praise your holy name. When you ask, do you love me? We can say with a wholeheartedly yes. We ask that you bless this time of worship so we may be uplifted and inspired by your presence. Fill us with your love and grace 
and help us to honor you in all that we do. All these things in your name. Amen. Good morning. You know, it's the week after Easter, but we still come to celebrate and respond to a God who is loving, a God who gives grace, and a God who restores us to a relationship with him. And so we come this morning to boast in the Lord, to sing of what he's done for us. So let's stand and worship him.
John 21, 15 through 23. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Boys and girls, y'all can come down for our children's time. I'm going to ask Mr. Wheel. He's going to be my helper today. Mr. Wheel, would you come up here? He didn't know that till just a little bit ago. So, how are you? How are y'all doing? Have y'all enjoyed spring break? Yeah, looking forward to the eclipse tomorrow. Kinda. Come here, Mr. Wheel. Wheel, how many kids do you have? Four. <laughs> Will, can you be with your kids all the time? No, I can't, Jeremiah. It's really hard when you got four to be with them. Can Kelly be with them all the time? No. So if you and Kelly aren't with them all the time, does Layla or George have to watch after the little ones? They're supposed to. They're supposed to. <laughs> They're supposed to. And um, what are some of the things you tell Layla and George uh, when they're in charge of little Will and Ella? Um, have them stay close to the house. Don't let the friends in the house. <laughs> That's right. And uh, why do you think they would obey what you uh, asked them to do? Because I'm their parent. <laughs> Good answer. You can, you can sit down, Will. I can tell you're real <laughs> excited about being up here. <laughs> How many of y'all have got uh, older brothers or sisters? Okay. How many of y'all got younger brothers or sisters? And how many of you are uh, an only child? Yeah. How many of y'all got younger brothers or sisters? How many of y'all got older brothers or sisters? Yeah. When I was a little boy, younger than Lily, I was kind of sickly. I couldn't help it, just the way it was. And my mom would tell my sister and my brother, without me knowing it, to watch after me, to take care of me when they weren't around. You know what? Jesus was sitting with his disciples, and they had just been fishing, and they're eating breakfast. And Jesus asked his disciple, Peter, do you love me? Does your mom and dad ever ask you, do you love them? Usually, um, we ask that question when y'all have done something really dumb and y'all have made a mess and you, you will say, do you love me because it doesn't look like you do. Y'all ever had that? 
Okay, this is not going as... You always plan these things, but they don't ever go the way you expect. Well, anyway, one of the ways that we show our parents that we love them is how we love our brothers and our sisters. How we take care of them, especially when our moms and dads aren't around. You know, if we're mean to our brothers and sisters when our mom and dads are not around, it might show that we don't love our mom and dad and we don't love our brother and sister. And Jesus tells Peter, Peter, essentially, I'm not going to be around. And I need you to love these brothers and sisters the way that I have loved you. And throughout John's gospel, Jesus has been called the good shepherd. And he tells Peter, who's a fisherman, to become a shepherd too. And he tells each of us to love our brothers and sisters if we love Jesus. So look at all of these people around here. Did you know that they're your brothers and sisters? No, some of them are pretty mature. And it would be weird to think of them as your brothers and sisters, but they are. And you know what? The older you get, the more you'll have to watch after some of the ones who are older. Yeah, did y'all think about that? We're all responsible to take care of each other. And that's what Jesus asked us to do after his resurrection, to love one another and to take care of one another. So boys and girls, I want you to look out there, and I want y'all to look here. They're to take care of you now, and one day you'll be taking care of them. And you do that because Jesus loves us, and we love you. Y'all sound so excited this morning, so excited. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your love, a love that comes to us in Jesus. And God, we pray that we will hear the voice of our master, Jesus, asking the question, do we love him? And in response, will we love and take care of and shepherd one another? Whether we are young or old, we all need each other. Help us, Lord, to love as you love, to care as you care, and to shepherd as you shepherd. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This is- 
As we come to our time of offering, I am reminded that what we give is not a reflection of our trust in money, but it's a reflection of our trust in God. Last week, as we watched our testimonies, I was struck by Chris Gladson's testimony, and when he said that he went to passport camp when he was in youth and realized that he really wanted to have a relationship with Jesus. And what hit me was the fact that this church didn't know him. He wasn't going here. He lived in Pendleton. And we were already giving to the camp that was speaking to him when he decided to commit his life to Christ. And years later, he would go back to that camp and become a worship leader for the children's camp and then the youth camp. And then our youth would meet him as he led worship, and he would come and be an intern here teaching our children to love God. And so what struck me about that was that God is working in ways we do not see. That was years in the process that the money we gave here would impact us years down the road. And it's just a beautiful picture of the tapestry that God is weaving that we may not see. And we get glimpses of that. Glimpses, and and I'm thankful that we got to know Chris and we got to know what our giving was going to, that that was just one story of the hundreds of kids that go every summer. But what a gift that we get to glimpse that and know that that is the story we get to see, but those stories are happening all all over the place. And this morning I was thinking about how lucky I am that I get to see on Saturday mornings when we do our food pantry that you're giving, though you guys don't get to see it, I want to share with you that the people who come in in the mornings, they share with us their stories, 
They share with us their trials. They ask for prayer. And we may not know their whole story, but we pray for them, and they're willing to embrace us as part of their life. And I'm just an ambassador for our congregation as a whole. And so I just want to say thank you for your giving, for the investment that you're making, and people you may never meet, but they're there. And just to remind us that our giving is not about the money. It really is about the work that's being done after it goes from this place. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Lord, we know we've heard today in our text that we are called to feed your sheep. And God, that means so much more than just food. God, we pray that what we can give, even though we know that it is not enough, God, we pray that in your hands it becomes abundant. Lord, we trust that because you are a faithful God, lives will be changed. God, that what we can give will become so much more and impact so many more. And we pray, Lord, that we would have the faith in you to know that that's true. In Jesus' name, amen.
We celebrated the resurrection of Jesus last week. As Sarah reminds us, we celebrate the resurrection every time we come together. And we should, for the resurrection of Jesus represents the highest moment in human history. For the resurrection represented the completion of the plan of redemption. God had set in motion this plan many, many years prior. And the, rep the resurrection said, the plan is complete. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished, representing certainly the completion of that gruesome crucifixion, that gruesome execution. But it is finished meant more. It meant that phase of the plan was over. It's now time for the next and final phase, the resurrection. It's a great story. It's a great uh, image. It's a great, if you want to put it in crass terms, it's a great product, this story of the resurrection, this reality of new life being raised from the dead. Now, if you're a manufacturer, if you make things and you develop something new, you develop the latest electronics product, you develop the latest phone or the latest gadget that you think people just have to have, you don't take that gadget or instrument and put it in a closet or put it on a shelf or lock it away in a, in a safe somewhere. You develop a marketing strategy and you tell everyone about your new product and you try to convince them they must have it. Now, you may get wealthy in the process, but that's just a byproduct, right? Well, we as the followers of Christ have been handed the most wonderful product in the world, and that is the resurrection power, the resurrection message, the reality that Jesus Christ living, Jesus Christ gives us new life, and we can share that new life with everyone we encounter, and we'll never... We'll never give it away in the sense that we won't have it. It continues growing and abounding, going from us and going forward. So the church of Jesus has been given the instruction that we are to market what Jesus has done, not so we can become wealthy, not so that we can sell this to anyone. We have the tremendous privilege of trying to give away what Jesus has given to us. Now, in order for us to be effective, there's some lessons that I think this scripture before us from John chapter 21, there's some lessons that will help us be the most effective marketers that we can be. Lesson number one, the church needs to understand the vital role restoration plays in our lives. We see this in this interaction between Jesus and Peter. Uh, there at breakfast, it's a very casual meal. They're on the side of the lake. Peter and his buddies have been fishing all night, and they spot Jesus. They did not first know it was Jesus, but they spot Jesus on the shore, and they make their way there along the way, recognizing Jesus, who has just given them a hint, or actually a straight direction, as to where they can find fish, for they've been ineffective all night long. They get to the shore. Jesus has fixed breakfast. They have some fish. Don't you usually eat fish for breakfast? Mm, yeah. They had some fish and some bread. Jesus had provided the bread, and they provided some of the fish, at least, from their catch. And then Jesus has this strange conversation with Peter. He says, Peter, do you love me? Well, now, we don't have any record that throughout the interaction of Jesus and the disciples in their three years together that there'd been a lot of uh, sentimental talk about love. They had not sat around the fire at night as they were traveling, telling each other how much they loved each other. So it may have caught Peter off guard. Perhaps their culture did not share these tender expressions of love either. Jesus blatantly and directly 
says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Well, of course I do. You know I do. Okay. Feed my sheep. And then he asked him again, and I don't know how long this conversation went on. In my mind, as I picture it, there were long pauses between these interactions. Time for Peter to wonder, why did he ask me that? And he came back a second time and said, Peter, do you love me? Well, of course. I've already told you. I love you. Then feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. And then a third time, again, for me, there was a long pause between the second and the third. The third time, Jesus came back and said to Peter once again, Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Okay, feed my sheep. Now, if you've studied this passage, and some of you have, you've taught it in Sunday school, you've heard sermons preached on it, you know some make a lot out of the different words for love that we find in the, the biblical language and the difference between feed my sheep and tend my lambs, and all of that is interesting to study. But what I see here is an interesting story in restoration. For Peter... <clears throat> Peter has declared earlier that the church, or Jesus has declared earlier that the church will be built on the kind of faith Peter has demonstrated toward Jesus. Let me read from Matthew chapter 16. Jesus asked, and he was in conversation with his disciples. He was asking them, among other things, who do people, just as you walk around, who do people say I am? And they had described what they said. And then Jesus said, but what about you? You've been following me for several years now. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, this rock-like faith that you are demonstrating, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he gave them orders not to tell anyone what had just been revealed, at least not yet. So Peter has made this bold declaration, Jesus, you are the Messiah. And Jesus has responded to him, praising him, thanking him, holding him up as an example of someone who has had this revelation from God and who has recognized the greatness of Jesus. But then if you know the story of Jesus during his trial... After he was arrested, three times Peter has denied even knowing Jesus. As if that were bad enough, Jesus has warned Peter before Jesus was arrested that he would do exactly that. And Peter had argued with him, no, no way. And looking around at the other disciples, Peter had said, they might bail, sell you out, but I will never ever betray you and yet three times before the sun came up during the night of that cruel trial Peter said I do not know this man Jesus has called Peter a rock solid dependable now that rock <laughs> That rock is turned to sand. How can Peter face Jesus? There's this cloud hanging over him. He wants to celebrate the resurrection. He's, he's seeing Jesus resurrected. He wants to be excited about that. But how can he face Jesus having betrayed him? And so Jesus initiates a process of restoration. That was what was in this conversation. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Jesus initiates a restoration process. Peter has denied him three times. Jesus questions him three times. Peter has denied him three times. Jesus 
restores him, speaking words of restoration to him three times. Jesus restores him first to relationship. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Cementing that relationship of love between Peter and Jesus. But he goes further than that. Jesus restores Peter to work, to service. Feed my sheep. In the story, as we follow it, we find that Peter has gone back to where Jesus found him when he first called him. Peter had gone back fishing. Now understand that Peter and some of his friends were professional fishermen. Maybe it was a matter that Peter thought the, uh, this wonderful hope of a, of a new spiritual kingdom, this wonderful hope of, of a, a great dream that Jesus had inspired in him, now with Jesus... He'd heard he'd been resurrected. He'd been in a group that had seen the resurrected Lord, but he had, he had betrayed Jesus. So what was in it for him? Might as well go back fishing. He had to feed his family. So he went back to where Jesus had found him originally, but now Jesus put Peter back where he had been before with Jesus. Feed my sheep. I've got work for you to do. You know restoration of a relationship is legitimate when you're trusted to do work with and for the one with whom you've been restored. Jesus is, is gluing back together the broken pieces of Peter's life and faith. And Jesus still does that through the work of the Spirit. The church functions as a group of broken people who have been and are being put back together by the loving, restoring power of Jesus. But full disclosure, the steps to restoration can be uncomfortable. Restoration is not always a pleasant task. My mother, I remember as a child, mother used to uh, restore old pieces of furniture I thought it was just because she liked to collect antiques. Now, no, we couldn't afford any better. But she would find an old piece of furniture somewhere, and she'd bring it home, and, and she would take off all the old layers of finish that people had put on it, getting it back down to the original wood. And then she would stain it. We have a few pieces in our home now that she did that with. But I remember she always did that work outside because it was messy and because some of those things she used to take off those layers of finish, well, they didn't smell very good. They were caustic. She always wore gloves. She was very careful in that restoration process. Restoring things and restoring lives can be very uncomfortable. But out of his love for us, Jesus takes the initiative when we need restoring working through the Holy Spirit who convicts us if we are open to conviction. And this restoration requires an ongoing spiritual work, forcing us to keep our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears open to the work of the Holy Spirit. Restoration can be painful because it requires us to face up to what and who we are as Jesus sees us. That, that conversation between Jesus and Peter had to have been hard for Peter because Peter was seeing how Jesus was seeing him, someone who was flawed, someone who had betrayed him. But he also saw that Jesus saw him as someone who was worthy to work in Jesus' kingdom. Do you love me? Not just do you love me, then do you love me more than these? Perhaps Jesus was talking to Peter, do you love me more than you love fishing? But more likely, Jesus was saying, Peter, do you love me more than all these other disciples? These disciples who you said, they may betray you, but I never will. Well, do you have a love for me that at least is as strong as their love or perhaps even greater than that love? Restoration often requires an honest evaluation of our priorities. 
How, how high a priority do we place on our relationship with our Lord? The same way that he did with Peter. Jesus meets us where we are. Peter and the other disciples did not make an appointment with Jesus and say, meet us on the, on the, on the shore of the lake early in the morning, and after we fished all night, we'll have breakfast with you. No, they went fishing. They had no plans for meeting Jesus. Jesus initiated. Jesus came to them. Jesus met them where they were. And Jesus meets, meets us where we are and leads us to where we need to be. And in our response to the love and the forgiveness of Jesus, we are then called to practice the same kind of love and forgiveness with others. This being restored comes with consequences. And as a restored people, Jesus expects us to be expanding his work of restoring, working always to be restoring relationships with others around us and to be preaching and teaching the message of restoration to the world around us. That includes forgiving others. Peter once asked Jesus, Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone up to, or someone who's wronged me? Up to seven times, and Jesus responded, not seven times, Peter, seven times 70, or seven times 77. There are several different ways of translating that phrase. But what Jesus was saying was, Peter, you don't count how many times you forgive. You forgive how many times someone needs forgiving. You don't make a list of how many times you've already forgiven so you can say, well, your forgiveness is up because God doesn't treat us like that. And so we are to be as forgiving as other, of others as God is forgiving of us. And forgiveness, Peter was told by Jesus, feed my sheep, serve others. And forgiveness is a means of serving others. A servant mentality makes us quicker to forgive. If we're serving each other, forgiving is just part of our service. Now, there's something else in this story, too, that tells us how, how best we can serve. And serving each other in this restoring business helps us get out the message for others notice how we are restoring each other and we're forgiving each other and we're working with each other. We best serve... We best serve when we're forgiving. We also best serve when we, when we stay in our lane. Do you like driving down the interstate when someone passes you and is weaving in and out, maybe has come in behind you and gotten close, and then don't you love being passed on the right side? Are you one that passes on the right side? Nobody here would do that, I understand. But these people that weave in and out, and you're, just, you're just fuming. Stay in your lane. Well, that's what Jesus says to Peter here. N not literally, but that's the point. You see, Jesus informs Peter of what his plan was or what God's plan was for Peter. He says, Peter, and he goes into some detail about how he was working now and how later uh, he would be treated. And Peter, at least church legend has it, Peter uh, he came to a very gruesome end, crucified, and by his choice, crucified upside down because he did not feel himself worthy to be crucified in the same manner that Jesus was. But Jesus had foretold that, not the upside down part, but had foretold that Peter would come to a, a horrible end. And after he told him that, Peter looked around and he saw his buddy John over here, one of the other disciples, and said to, said to Jesus, uh, what about him? Uh, you just told me I'm not going to wind up so well. Well, what about him? Maybe I'll feel better about my demise if, if his is going to be at least as bad. And what did Jesus say to him? If I can translate it into modernese, Jesus said to Peter, what happens with John is none of your business. 
mind your own business. Stay in your lane. You follow me. God's plan for other believers varies from his plan for us. God's reasons for his plan for other believers is not always clear to us and may not be clear to them. I wonder how much church jealousy and conflict would be avoided if we all stayed in our own lanes. How much conflict and jealousy could be avoided if we didn't try to tell other people how to drive. I've been doing this for a number of years, what I try to do. And I discovered a long time ago, there's always somebody who thinks they know better how to do my job than I do. And they're usually right. <laughs> but it's so very easy to look at someone else and their relationship with Christ and to see how they're doing it. It's so very easy to say, well, you know, they ought to. Or, you know, you ought to. Or, you should. Or, Lord, you should be doing this with them. Let's hear the word of Jesus today. Stay in your lane. You'll be better for it, and they'll be better for it. Now, there's one, thing, there's one final lesson I want to draw out here very quickly. When Jesus told Peter, Peter, you don't worry about what's going to happen with John. And then he says, if, and underscore the word if, if I want him to still be alive when I return, that's none of your concern, Peter. But as it sometimes happens, the if got dropped when the story got told around in the early church. And it began to be told that, well, John's going to still be here when Jesus returns. That wasn't what Jesus said, was it? He said, if that's what I want. So the final lesson is that we will serve more effectively and we will be better at this restoration business and we will be better able to market the truth about Jesus Christ and we'll serve better if we're careful about what we believe and what we tell about what we believe. Jesus did not boldface not underscored all caps Jesus did not say Jesus, John would still be alive. He said if I want him to be that's none of your business. What we believe about biblical truth and about life and the world in general we got to be careful. Why would someone believe our witness for Christ if they hear us and see us buying into some of the fanciful stories that abound due to people's obsession with online, I hate to use the word information, I'm not even sure it is informing us. We've got to be secure in our relationship with our Lord and service by being careful with what and who we listen to and believe. Don't believe everything we hear unless it comes directly from Jesus. And be careful of those who claim to speak for Jesus. And yes, I know sometimes I am one. But we are responsible. We are responsible to weigh carefully everything we hear and everything we choose to believe and everything we tell others about what we believe. This false rumor about Jesus' words to Peter about John's staying around demonstrate very clearly how easy it is to misunderstand God's promise. We are responsible to understand God's word accurately. Lessons. Lessons that help us better be prepared to live out our lives as restored people in Christ and to share that message with our world. Restoration may be difficult, but it's worth the effort because it can lead to healthy churches 
and healthy Christians. Let's pray together. Let's take a moment and just consider as the Holy Spirit works in our lives individually and with us collectively, what kind of restoration work is the Spirit wanting to do in you today or to begin in you today? Will you engage? We engage the Lord prompted by the Spirit in that conversation. What restoration do you want to do in me today, to begin in me today? Lord, by your Spirit, may we continue this conversation. It doesn't have to end when we walk out the doors of this building. May we continue this conversation being open to whatever it is and however it is that you want to be restoring us to relationship with you, to relationship with others. Work in us now and continue that work. We are receptive to it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As the Spirit continues His restoration work in us, how may the church, your church, help you in that work? If we can help you today, tell us about it. If a part of that help involves some sort of public demonstration on your part, now is the good time to do that. Let's stand together and sing. You come and share your concerns as we're singing. glad you could be a part of this worship time today. Go from this place with the Spirit of God continuing to restore you and continuing to show you how you can be part of His restoration effort throughout the world. Let's go from here singing, shall we? <laughs>